Alright. We're recording once again. Alright, Foundational Doctrines, the Church of Jesus Christ, number four. And Father. Lord, help me to preach. Help me to teach. Help me to do, Lord, what it is I'm supposed to do. Sometimes it gets hard. Lord, but, regardless, Lord, I need to do what needs to be done. And so I need to do it according to your will and the way that you'd have it done. And so I pray that you will bless the message, Lord, and help me to deliver it as you gave it to me. Lord, for the sake of those that are here to hear it. And we pray and ask for it in Christ's name. Amen. Now in our study, again, we'll review it real quick. Five topics in relation to the main topic. The main topic being the Church of Jesus Christ. Those five topics have been what the Church is, who the Church is, why the Church is, what the Church is to be doing, and how it is to accomplish what it is to be doing. And under number four, what the church is to be doing, we had three prime functions. The glorification of the Lord, the edification of the saints, the propagation of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the lost. Now under these three, uh, you know, we looked at what was meant by each one of these. Then we began to look at number five last week. The final heading, which is concerned with how the church is to carry out those three prime functions. And we understood that the motive and the mindset but behind doing all three was key to that. And so this is the point that we're going to delve into things from there this evening. The how-to of the process of accomplishing what the church is supposed to be doing. So we begin with the glorification of the Lord. John chapter 12, verse 28. Gospel of John. Chapter 12, verse 28, I believe I read this verse last week, Christ is speaking and he says, Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven, saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. And God just stuck in my mind here about the fact that we got those oneness heretics out there like T.D. Jakes. So that there is no trinity. Well, that was an awful good bit of ventriloquism right there. <laughs> Lord Jesus Christ, here he is on the earth. You know, okay. <laughs> Don't look, my lips didn't even move. Stupid. Stupid, stupid, stupid. Father, glorify thy name. And there came a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it, and I will glorify it again. We were to go to Psalm 138 and verse 2. In the Psalms, 138, verse number 2. Pages turn, there we go. I will worship toward thy holy temple, and... Praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. First 12 verses. This is the entire chapter. 
Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus, sons of the church of the Thessalonians, and God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired and all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Wherefore also we pray always for you, that our God would count you worthy of this calling, and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. That the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you, and ye in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I stated this last week that there are 116 separate references in the scriptures to the glorification of the Lord. And if our very existence is to glorify the Lord, and as we have a public witness of being the Lord's people, or at least we ought to, every aspect, every aspect of both our personal and our public lives ought to therefore glorify the Lord. And when I say personal, I mean your private life. But folks don't see ought to glorify the Lord as much as what they do see. Let me state it plainly. If you are not striving to glorify the Lord in your personal life, just how do you expect, you know, how do you think you're going to do so in conjunction with the rest of the body, the church of Jesus Christ? Remember, at the beginning of this study, began pointing out the fact that there are three spheres of influence and responsibility under God. The home, and there's your personal private life. The church, which is what we're looking at, and then human government. I also stated that motive and mentality Okay. Behind any act are every bit as important, if not more important, than the act itself. A lot of people will do things but have the wrong motive or mentality to what they're doing. Okay. And if you are not glorifying the Lord with your personal life, how do you expect to assist the church in glorifying him. Okay. As the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, the church, in order to glorify its head, must be unified of one mind, striving together as a whole. If it's fractured, it's not going to accomplish a thing. So the united motive and mindset of the body must have as its goal the glory of 
the Lord. Okay. You don't have that unity in a church, it's not going to accomplish much anything. It's just the truth. The focus of all that we do must be targeted exactly as this, which is 1 Corinthians 10.31. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of the Lord. Okay, if you're, what you eat and drink and how you eat and drink, okay, can or cannot glorify the Lord, okay, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Thing is, the opposite's also true. Opposite is always true. And there's always the opposite. If it does not, okay, if it's not going to glorify the Lord, then why are you doing it? Okay, don't do it. I mean, some of the things that churches get involved in some of the things that individual believers get involved in, I mean, it just leaves me scratching my head. And it just tells me they don't understand what they're supposed to be about. They just don't. And I also want to make the point of Psalm 138, verse 2. That point again, for thou hast magnified thy word, little w, above all thy name. Come on, think about all the names and titles associated with the Lord in the scripture. Consider, okay, consider what the Lord has to say in the light of this about taking his name in vain how he feels about that and that he as he said over in John 12 28 will continue himself to glorify his own name and that he has magnified his word above all his name? Sorry, you cannot begin to glorify the Lord if His Word, the Holy Bible, does not hold a place of prominence and honor and authority and priority in your life or that of any church. Go over to Deuteronomy 6. All the way back Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words, W-O-R-D-S, which I command thee this day, shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates." might think that God wanted to, you to take his word as something that's supposed to have some prominence and priority and authority in your life. Glorify the Lord, yes, glorify me, but by the way, I've made my word. Okay, okay. magnified it above all my name. How is any church going to glorify the Lord when it does not believe that he's preserved his words? 
How are they going to do that? Oh, we're here to glorify the Lord, but you don't believe that you got His words. How are you going to do that? And he said himself, I magnified my word above all my name. They don't accept any scripture as inspired. They don't accept any scripture as having been preserved by God. Their faith rests on a human best guess and personal preferences and not on a dogmatic final authority presented by and preserved by the Lord himself. Tell me how they can glorify God who has magnified his word above all his name. Pick the one you like the best. The one that's easiest for you. They all say the same thing. Now, I hear one more person tell me that. It's like, really? Have you looked at him? No, no. <laughs> yeah. Acts chapter 9, verse 31. We're going to move on to the edification of the saints. I could spend forever on that one. Though. <laughs> yeah. Acts 9. Acts 9. Verse 31. Now we're looking at the edification of the saints. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. Romans 15. A whole bunch of scripture we're going to look here in relation to the edification of the saints. Romans 15, first two verses. Then we're going to go back to 14, verse 19. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. Go back to chapter 14, verse 19. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians 10, we're going to look at verses 23 and 24 to begin with. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Go to chapter 14 in 1 Corinthians. We've got several in 1 Corinthians to look at. 1 Corinthians 14, 1 through 5, follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts. We'll come back to that. But rather that you may prophesy, that's what I'm doing. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him. Howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. But he that prophesied speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. But he that prophesieth edifieth the church. I would that ye all speak with tongues, but rather that ye prophesy. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues except he interpret, that the church may receive edifying. And we won't go into tongues tonight. I've preached very clearly about that. This chapter is a defining chapter. Go down to 12 through 19 in this chapter. Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, 
Seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. How much plainer can it get? Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. It's unknown to him, too. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then if I pray with the spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. Else, when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say, Amen, at thy giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest? For if thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than y'all. Southern. <laughs> Yet in the church, I'd rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Now later on, at the very end of this chapter, Paul said, man, forbid not to speak with tongues. Yep as long as they follow the rules that are laid out here in chapter 14. <laughs> yeah, they run into a problem when they hit that brick wall. Verse 26, How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a song, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. Verse 40. Let all things be done decently and in order. Go to 2 Corinthians 12. So we're going to get into the subject of tongues tonight. 2 Corinthians 12, 18 and 19. I desired Titus, and with him I sent a brother. Did Titus make a gain of you? Walked we not in the same spirit? Walked we not in the same steps? Again, think ye that we excuse ourselves unto you? We speak before God in Christ. But we do all things, dearly beloved, for your edifying. That's the motive. Ephesians. Go to Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 16. And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ that's what was the purpose of every one of that group up there till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love, whether it hurts or not, may grow up unto him in all things which is the head, even Christ from whom the whole body fitly joint together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Stay in that chapter, 21 to 29. If so be that ye have heard of him, and been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. That you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt, 
according to the deceitful lusts. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, the things which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace unto the hearers. First Thessalonians 5.11 First Thessalonians 5.11 Wherefore, comfort yourselves together, and edify one another, even as also you do. 1 Timothy 1.1 1, 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior, and the Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope, unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith so do. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. And back in Corinthians chapter 8 verse 1, the latter part of that verse says, knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Charity, love in action. Back, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 this time. 1 Corinthians 13. We're going to read that whole chapter. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. And charity edifieth. And though I have <clears throat> the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge. And though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity edifies. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth, all things, endure it, all things. Charity never faileth. If charity never faileth, then somebody's always getting edified. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I speak as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. 
But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, and then interprets the passage for you. That which is perfect has come is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who you're going to see face to face. Now I know in part, but then, praise God, then 